Hey, welcome back to the Real Estate Excellence Podcast with your host, Tracy Hayes. I have the crusader, as she <laughs> will never back down from a fight for a worthy cause. She is recognized by Jack's Real Producers Magazine as a top producer in Northeast Florida. She is a Florida native, but married to a sailor who served for 28 years. She commits herself to helping other military wives in relocation. She not only sells real estate, but she also does property management as well. Let's welcome the grace and gratitude of Hover Girl Properties, Miss Bobby Brennan, to the show. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Bobby. I'm glad you could come on today. Going through, I did, like I said, I messaged you last night. I, I did go through your article with Jack's Real Producers that Kristen Lunsford put together. So uh, that gave me kind of a skeleton to, to talk about uh, with you here today. So uh, as I start off, everyone, you are from Florida, but where in Florida? Where'd you grow up? Well, I was born in Milton, Florida, because my father was also military. But we moved shortly afterwards to Orange Park, Florida. Grew up in Orange Park. I went to elementary school, middle school, and high school in Orange Park. Ah, an so, Orange Parkian. I'm an Orange Park girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I, I was reading the bio, or the, reading the story, actually, in the, the magazine there. You did go off to college, but Dad called you back. Uh, Mom was ill. If, if we... my, my mother was sick, so I was in college, and my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And a selfish little brat, basically, is the way you described yourself uh, before going. But coming back and having this conversation, you had to grow up and mature very quickly. Well, and, and I say it this way. Most of us in our teenage years are selfish. We, and it's not that we purposely mean to be. We just don't think about our parents or anybody else and what their needs are. And I, I definitely was one of those kids. I was caught up in myself. And, you know, my brothers were my brothers. But losing my mother forced me to grow up and realize how important my brothers and my dad and the people, friends mm -hmm. in my life were. And that became my focus. I never changed. So how old were your, your younger so one of my brothers, at this time, he you... was 15. I had a brother that was just a year younger than me, uh, but he, he had a lot of struggles. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just, I focus on them. Now, was your, your dad actually still serving at the time? He was. So he was. he's being deployed. Well, or... he at that time, he wasn't being deployed. In fact, uh, shortly after probably a year in, in a, I'm sorry because a lot of this is kind of yeah, it's been a while it, convoluted it, 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 in my brain. Right. But uh, shortly after that, he moved to Texas, and my youngest brother went with him. But then my youngest brother came back to Jacksonville and moved in with me, mm -hmm. and he stayed with me for years, probably another ten, fifteen years that he stayed oh, wow. with me. All right, so you're. We're talking, you're in your young 20s at this time. Young 20s, and I also got married in my young 20s. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I've been married twice. The, my first marriage, I was in my young 20s, and he was an airline pilot. He was military and then an airline pilot. So he was gone a lot, and my youngest brother moved in with me, and I had a little boy, and we just, he stayed with me. And right. I went through a divorce, and he was with me through the divorce, and that's He's actually on my real estate team now, too. Is that right? Good for, good for him. So, so at that time, I mean, were you just, because he was an airline pilot doing well, that you were just a stay-at-home mom? Or what, what were you? No, I, I was still in sales. I don't know how. I'm sure everybody remembers. Your LinkedIn story. wasn't completely filled in. So I, I know. <laughs> I know. And as I said, my 20-year-old daughter is giving me grief about that. <laughs> uh, no, I was, I've always been in sales. So back then, I was working at Body Shop and Jared's. They okay. were popular stores here in town. And I worked with them forever. In fact, I would say some of the best sales training I received was from a lady named Lena Vanosky, Lena Hedinger. She, you know, she communicated to us the importance of sales, but what made you a good salesperson is recognizing what your customer needed. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my sales... Was that, where was that? As, at, what? In my 20s. What, so what, what store was that, that that gave you that? 
Oh, well, she was, that was we a, were at both stores. Oh, the, both one company owned both stores. Oh, okay, so. okay. It, it that's it's not. I've had other people come on, and and I think that's a very good point to make. There's some of these corporate stores uh, that are out there that do actually have great retail training and they you're do. not the, you're not the first agent that that has expressed that and some of those some of those core things because I think the average person thinks sales comes naturally personality comes naturally but understanding some of the basics of the sales process and then you mold that process to wherever you're working at there's not a set thing for everybody but you know depending on what you're doing whether it's real estate or working in a, a jewelry store or whatever there's a there's a process to what you're doing but why is there a process and then where do you insert your personality you know uh, understanding you know buying signs understanding when like Shut your mouth. Yes, <laughs> you know, those types yes. of things. Keep your opinions to yourself. Keep your opinions to yourself. Yeah. Some of those some of those things that um, you know, I, you don't think about yourself, but you have to understand that you're obviously trying to uh, sell a good to make a living to someone else who has different beliefs and different background, uh, so to speak. Well, I will say, you know, going working with that company for years, I have always been honest with any customer I've had. I don't care if you're buying clothes from me or pharmaceutical equipment to houses. Mm -hmm. I believe in being honest, but I, I also genuinely like to talk to people and get to know people. And when you do that, you know how to sell to them because you know what they want because you care. And when I left the retail business of clothing, I went to pharmaceutical equipment and I think the greatest lesson I learned was at that pharmaceutical equipment company. And Dr. Jerry Hayes mm. said, if you upset one doctor, that one doctor then shares that with 10 other doctors. You focus on the customer that is with you in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's what you need to do. I mean, Don't, that's, that's where that, that one bad apple spoils the, right. yeah. And I think, too often in the real estate world, in any any sales world, everybody gets caught up with volume of customers and forgets to focus on that one customer you're with at that that very moment. Uh, I, I agree. I, obviously, our short term spans, but you can, especially as you get deeper into what you're doing and you're doing all our last year when one sale was coming after another and you just, you're just going and running from, you know, one showing to the closing and it, it, you know, things are, people are calling you saying, Hey, it, things were easy from the standpoint. You didn't have to do your day to day things. And then you, what you end up doing is you start neglecting you do. the, uh, adding that little touch, which makes you long-term successful. I see, I don't want to say I see too many agents. I think there's a uh, not only in the real estate world, the mortgage loan officer world, but I think in 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 general, if you have a very short term vision of what you're doing, you know, versus the long term, like hey, I want to do the right thing. I may lose a customer today, but I'm going to gain two ne next year because I'm doing the right thing and exactly. staying. And I, that and I think that touches into your your faith. And that's another question I want to. And because I feel the same way. I mean, you you have to st stick with it, keep being consistent, doing the right thing, and it will reap fruit for you. It may not be tomorrow. That guy who cuts the corner may have the fruit today, but the question is, what are they doing next year, five years from now and so forth? Exactly. Are you paying attention to your customers? I, I, you know, I've thought about what is my business plan? Well, and I think I started telling you my mm -hmm. business plan is very different in that I, I didn't get in this for money. I know a lot of people say that's ridiculous. Everybody gets in everything for money. <laughs> right. I honestly came into this looking for something to do part-time. Mm -hmm. We had just moved back from Miami. We were stationed at Southcom. And the article talks about that, too. So down in Miami, when we were down there, large military community, we all rented these homes. And it, it was expensive to rent down there. So we all rented these homes, and then we all got foreclosed on. I, I can't tell you how many families got foreclosed on. And it wasn't just once. They're, was, they were renting, and the owners got foreclosed on. The landlords mm -hmm. got foreclosed on. Never paid a single mortgage payment. Oh, my God. 
so there was a huge number of us. And I just started researching and figuring out how we could tell when a home was in foreclosure or going into foreclosure. And then my name got passed on to other people and they passed on to their friends. So people, and I wasn't in real estate, but people would call me, can you check this house out for us? Let us know. Because obviously down there, when you're military, nobody knew to go through a management company or find a real estate agent to represent you. A lot of people were just going straight online, looking on Craigslist or whatever Mm -hmm. to find a rental. And without having a legal representative to check for you, they didn't know. So they started calling me. And then coming back, I found out I was coming back to Jacksonville. Lori Yale, one of the owners of Hubbard Girl Properties, she and I talked and decided, you know what? Let's give this a try. Mm -hmm. I like working with military. I'm from here. I have a lot of family and friends in the area. So it just seemed like a perfect fit. Um, One of the questions I have later, but since we're kind of talking about this right now, um, can you uh, dabble a little bit on military relocation? You know, what you do, because you guys do focus on that. It's one of your, your, your focus points. And why is it beneficial for someone in the military being re- relocated to Jacksonville or out of Jacksonville to be connected with someone like yourself that's familiar with the process, familiar of how the military, what are, what are some, some even maybe even tell a story, uh, uh, even a horror story, because those always like bring people to realization, why it's important that uh, things can be easier when you're working with someone who's experienced in that area. Well, uh, I, I would say first, because a lot of our customers are overseas, definitely out of state, uh, working with us, we're familiar with how your orders can get changed at the last minute. We know how to go through the whole process. We know how it is with the movers. We can help you with every step of, of your process of moving. But the nice part about us is we're so accustomed to doing everything via FaceTime or Skype or Zoom. Yes, people still use Skype. I know that's surprising. (laughs) But we can do all of it. And when you are out of state in your military, you want to know that you have somebody you can trust. Let's say somebody came here, bought a house, a military member, bought a house. They moved. They're stationed somewhere else. They need you to manage the property. They need you to go check things out for them. We do all of it. We do the whole process. We know your time zones overseas or in the country. We're, we're just very familiar with the process. Do you find, uh, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask the questions for our audience. Your military, these military people who you don't meet face-to-face a lot of times before closing or, or so forth, they're calling from overseas you're to a line that, or you're taking care of their house and you ne- they have no real relationship with you. They've never shook your hand or whatever, but because of your background, uh, you know, your husband's service and so forth, you're able to tell obviously the story that, you know, just explained to me being down in Miami that you, you, treaded some of the same turf that they have. You've dealt with some of the same pains and issues or whatever, Correct. dealing with the military and the orders and so forth, that they bond with you and, and there's a trust right away. I do. And actually, that's some I should have said too. We're very familiar with VA loans, so we can walk them through all that steps. We're also familiar with everything that they're protected with legally. You know, if they're, let's say, homestead exemption. Mm-hmm. Not everybody knows that a military member can move away and their homestead exemption is protected. I did not know that. I just learned that right now. So as Didn't long I? as they don't own other properties, it's protected. So it's it's little things like that. Mm-hmm. But also, I think, and you're right, there are a large number of my customers that have never met me face-to-face. But I think they know me, and I think I know them just through our talking and meeting over video. Right, right. I, I just, you know, we were talking about, you know, my background work from the Citadel and so forth. And 
every obviously every, there's a military college in South Carolina, they all of us go in there thinking, and we all take ROTC, <laughs> and obviously, you know, we're, we're being led by these colonels and you know, lieutenants and so forth, TAC officers, and, and they have that, and you create these bonds um, that whether or not you actually, you know, I went to my reunion here a couple of weeks ago, whether or not we actually hung out 30 years ago or not, we still are, we walk in there and we can carry on a conversation and we immediately bond just having that, I don't know, there's just this intrinsic faith that that person has your back because you know their, you have somewhat of their ideology. You've treaded some of the same True. pains and so forth. And I, I, I could see that being one of the benefits there of you bonding with a, a, a lot of our uh, military uh, folks. So skipping back, go back, you, you, um, you're down there in Miami. You're starting to kind of create your own property management or being the guru, the person to go to. What, but what, did you have any career aspirations? I mean, what was your, did you, I mean, cause you kind of fell into real estate in a way, but did you actually ever have an aspiration to do something else? I mean, what, in your- so actually real estate was not what I was looking for. My passion. I love working with kids. Uh, kids of all ages. So I honestly thought when we got down to Miami and I was struggling with the sales job down there because I didn't speak Spanish. And I honestly thought, well, it's a good time for me to go back to college. And I wanted to go to college for special education. Uh, But then, you know, working and doing this and realizing, and as I said, it wasn't a job. I was just doing it. Working with the military, I realized I really like doing this. I like just working with the military. The military is a community. Mm-hmm. You know, as oh, you huge. said, you can, uh, uh, an example is we went to a party the other night to watch the light parade. We met a Naval Academy graduate from years ago. But when she was sitting and talking to my husband about what her path was, and as I said, she went to the Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. My husband went to SUNY Maritime. Mm -hmm. They started talking, and he realized that one of his friends that went into the shipping industry had crossed paths with her. Well, when he mentioned his name, you know, she was very close friends with this guy. Uh, Yeah. So it's it's a wonderful community that you can reach out all over Mm -hmm. the country and out of the country. We have a young girl coming in town. One another, one of the kids of a graduate, and she's coming in town to work for the shipping industry, and she's going to live with us until we can find a house for her to buy. So it's just that community feeling with the military right. that drew me to real estate. And you know, it is, again, it's not just did they ever meet somewhere. It, the age gap, the generation gaps, close very quickly. Oh, yeah. Someone may have served at a totally different time. Yes. But, hey, I was in Okinawa or whatever. I was in uh, Pearl Harbor, wherever it may have been. And your husband has treaded through there maybe 10 years difference before or after. They still talk about. Oh, they do. The same, yeah. <laughs> they do. And trading the store. Oh, is that bar still there? Or is everyone still like to go yes. to this hangout or whatever, whatever it is? And it, and it just, it creates that. I've been from the same place. You know, we grew up in the same hometown. Yes. Sort of that type feeling yes. uh, from that standpoint. All right. So you're in, you're in, when you're in Miami, are you actually working with a brokerage or you don't really start no, working no, no. a brokerage until you I come was, here to Jacksonville? Right. I was not in real estate at all. That was just me being a stay at home wife for the first time in years. And just, I had time on my hands. So I started, um, investigating different homes and actually had a meeting down at Southcom with all the powers that be on what needed to be done and how it was hurting us. Because when you're paying, it's very different down South. You don't just pay first month's rent and security deposit. You have to pay basically three months. So you're losing all that money. And then you're having to pay for movers to come move you. And and military families can't afford that. Because if they're moving locally, they're not paying for that. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. Right. So it became very expensive for the military. And then coming back up here, that's 
that's where I realized I wanted to do uh, this. So, y- y- did you already know the owners of Hover Girl? When did, when did I did. You, I've you, known Laura over 20 years. We had our kids around the same time. We used to walk to try to bring on our pregnancy labor, <laughs> have them come early. But no, I've known Laura a very long time. All right, so you call her up and say, I'm coming to Jacksonville. I did. I'm coming back. And that's when you start the conversation about Correct. real estate. Correct. Okay. So... You you're now stepping in the door. Your first day at Hover Girl. You're still are you still in the part time mentality? Well, it's funny when I first started. Uh, my husband was deployed to Bahrain for a year, so I was going to do it part time. But then I just went full force. Mm-hmm. I got into it completely immersed, and um, I loved it. I mean, I from the start I loved it, and I started off. This with is 2010, if I recall. 2010. Mm-hmm. And I started with just the property management, doing rentals. And I I think within a couple of years, I started, I would do maybe one or two sales a year from friends. And then it just kind of grew and grew from Started there. to snowball for you. Mm-hmm. So um, as you, you, have you really ever, you never probably, I can't imagine, you never had the door knock. No, I've never. Never. Uh, I mean, do you do, have you ever done any cold calling? No, and I'm probably a little different on how I feel about that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, everybody goes after those FISBOs or terminated listings. And I, I just find that when it's a terminated listing, that owner is getting 80 calls a day. Right. Well, I can sell your house. I can and I just, I don't want to be that person. I I honestly mean it when I say my plan is so different. Mine is about relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, another example that I'll give you. We were flying up to New York to go to my husband's college reunion. And I'm a talker. And I was I was on a flight. And I'm talking to the lady. How many glasses week. of wine did you have at this Actually, point? Actually, <laughs> and you're, you'd be surprised because I'm terrified of flying. Married two pilots, but I'm terrified of flying. So I was just talking. I was talking about Italian restaurants to the lady next to me because she was afraid of flying, and I was trying to calm her down. And once we started talking, everybody around us started talking. Then they found out I was a real estate agent. So then they had lots of questions about the market, and here's where I live. What do you think about me buying now? I handed out 13 business cards before we ever landed. Mm-hmm. And that's that's why, I mean, my plan is not, I'm not great at social media. My social media is typically about kids, family, friends. Or if I know somebody that's in need, I'll post about that and I'll ask for help. You know, can you help me get this person set up? But it's not typically about the business. I will occasionally post it. Um, it's about relationships. And I think relationships are what have made me successful. When, so let's, we talked earlier about one of the goals of the show and it was to inspire a new agent or maybe an agent who's hit a lid, you know, uh, or maybe now needs to go full time. Maybe they were part time and just figured they were going to tinker with it, but now uh, do need to, to grow. Um, your story may to them go well. I'm not a I'm not uh, you know a wife of a naval aviator. I, I'm not yeah. in that whole that huge community. I can't do what Bobby's done. And I think you can take though some of the some of the subtle things that you're explaining here about the relationship. I have been spending a lot of time. Uh, like I said, I got my YouTube channel up. A, you know, about a month ago, and now I've learned how to, you know, my media company does create some reels for me, but I'm going back into a lot of the old episodes and cutting out these reels. So I'm listening for some, you know, just some inspirational or uh, educational, uh, you know, sound bites, and I'm going through there and how many of the agents uh, and even non-agents that I've had on talking about the relationships and how you... uh, 
you just need to interact with people. You can use social media to do it if, if you're on there. There are a lot of people building social media relationships. Just saying hi, hey, I saw your kid. You know, someone I had I did a reel the other day. Someone said something about you know mentioning, hey, I saw your kid got straight A's or whatever because somebody bragged about it online mm -hmm. and so forth. But explain, give, give me your explanation of the relationship building that you're done. Obviously you handed out all those business cards. The first person, which I think is the rudest thing to ask, how many deals did you get off of? You don't even probably even know how many deals. You may have gotten one direct deal, but how many indirect deals did you get from those 13 people who told all told three or four people themselves, hey, I met this great lady on the, on the flight up to the... Well, here's the thing. It may not have worked right away. You know, it, it was just a month ago. Mm -hmm. But they have my car and they have my face. Yep. They know our conversations because we all were looking for Italian restaurants. <laughs> we all wanted to talk about who they thought had the best Italian restaurant. Right. So they know that it's a process. It's building building that relationship. And I I feel like I provided them with some trust that they can call me because I always say, and I'm I mean this when I say it. If you have any questions at all, whether you use me or not, if you have questions, call me. I'm happy to help you. Right, I'm right. happy to answer a question. But to your point, yes, in the military community, but I'm also from here. I'm from Clay County. I, I have a family full of teachers, principals, athletic directors, you name it. Right. But I also, I live in Mandarin. So I'm across the river and I go to a huge church. And what my whole point about this is, it's your community. You know, are you a baseball mom or a dad? Are you in CrossFit? Right. Are you, you know, part of it? Is your daughter, or your kids, part of anything that you're involved with? That's your community. That's who you talk to. That's how you engage with people. Um, you bring up something interesting here, mentioning the you know the different things and in, including your church and so forth. How important is it for even loan officers, but, you know, since we're talking real estate agents is a subject here for real estate agents. One of the key, key things we talk about is showing up and whether it's showing up to a, a, an event that hover girls involved in, or, you know, a lender's putting on for you to meet other real estate agents, but like being involved in your church and so forth, or like you said, the ball team, actually showing face there. That is actually part of the thing. Seeing you show up at the ball game uh, every uh, week or the practices, the other moms are seeing you. How important is showing up? Showing up is very important. I think now when I say showing up is very important to your business, don't make that your reason for showing. Show up because you care about that community that I'm talking about. Show up for different things. You have to build relationships. I do think it's very tough to be part-time in real estate, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you really have to focus on building your relationships and make them genuine relationships. So, yes, yeah, showing up is, is extremely important. And, and I don't think you're, you know, you said be your reason, but it is real estate is your lifestyle, right? Showing up to these things is part of the lifestyle of being a realtor. And part of your marketing thing is, like you said, those people on the plane, they may not have shook your hand, but they heard you talk, you interacted with them. You had a common a subject of the Italian restaurants going on. And that was a way of, of uh, you bonding. And now they do feel warm that, you know, three months from now they could call you because they actually saw sure. you. and. You know, saw, like you said, saw your face. You had some sort of interaction where if you're at the ball field and you're showing up and they get to know you, hey, you're Johnny's mom. And who knows? It could be a year later. But because you showed up and maybe there was some small talk or something, but they now have, have bonded. They know who you are. They know where you live. They know you're, you're a decent person to, to work with. Well, and honestly, it's about don't be afraid to talk to people. I mean... Look, my brother, my youngest brother always teases us about our church goodbyes. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard that term. <laughs> the church goodbyes. My, my youngest brother calls it a church goodbye. He's like, oh, there she goes, another church goodbye, which means on my way out of church, I probably stop and talk to 30 different people, and I talk forever. I want to know 
how's it going? I, to your point, I saw so-and-so on your social media that this happened. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. But it's when I say don't make it your reason, what I mean, what I'm trying to stress is be genuine. Be genuine. And yes, you have to engage. You have to talk to people. To explaining someone business of real estate, and this is not just real estate. You could take this to car sales. You could take any type of sales uh, whatsoever. It could be a doctor trying to build a practice in, in a community. That time that you're spending, yes, you have to genuinely be interested. If you're not interested, then it's probably not your strong point of from a marketing standpoint. But you, if you actually do care about people, uh, there are some people, yeah, yeah, I would probably be like your brother going, I'm ready. We're out in the car. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and you're having these conversations because you truly enjoy them. And it, it's it's a long term play. You can't be in it for, you know, just buying the leads and that sort of thing is a short term play. Hopefully you can turn that one, the lead you get that actually becomes a transaction into a long term play. In other words, you create a relationship with them and they become a referral source for you, you know, for a, a lifetime, you know, become their, you know, obviously we'd all like to be someone's lifetime lender or lifetime real estate agent and who they refer everybody out to because you never know who you're, who you're meeting, but um, you have to, would you agree as a real estate, you have to be thinking beyond just tomorrow. You have yeah. to be thinking what am I doing in 2023? Could that person give me a referral in 2024? You do need to be thinking ahead. You need to, you, you need to be touching your customers, you know, that, and what I mean by that is don't ignore them. You know, don't get that commission check and walk away. I become Facebook friends with most of my customers because I want to know mm -hmm. what's going on in their life. And, and I, I think, and where I say I don't do much social media business-wise, in a way I do, in that I want people to know who I am. I want them to know my family. I want them to know my faith. Right. Those things are important to me. So, yes, you know, staying in touch with those customers is how you're going to build your business. All right. You just mentioned faith, so that's going to transition me to the next question here. And I wrote this out because this is right in your article. If you didn't no. cheat on my notes over here. Oh, I didn't. All right. This is right from your, your I article. I don't have glasses on. I can't okay. see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a strong faith. My faith in God tells me there is a purpose for everything. There is a reason everything happens, and God calls on us to be there, to love people, to be kind, and to be thoughtful. How much does your faith play into your daily your daily thoughts and your in your, your marketing or just your your overall attitude uh, every day and getting up and getting out? I would say my faith plays into one hundred percent of my life. When I right down to when I get upset, I will question myself that night and think, "Why did I do that?" You know, I feel like we have had a lot of tragedy in my family. And I'll never forget when I lost my younger brother, somebody came up to me at the funeral and said, you all have gone through so much. How do you get through it? And how do you feel about it? And I talk about this to a lot of people. After those losses, I can look back and see where God was in my life and how God showed me that it's okay and there was a reason this happened. And because of that, I, I am content in my heart. I, I'm happy. I am comfortable with most everybody I meet. And I truly believe that if we could all be just a little bit kinder and more thoughtful towards everybody, we all have people that are going to do things that hurt us or people that have made mistakes that have caused us pain. And if we're not forgiving and moving on from that, it's going to, it just consumes you. And I'm old enough to know these things. Mm -hmm. If you let all that into your life, it consumes everything you do. It hurts your business. It hurts your family life. So if you can just every day decide, I'm going to make it a better day. And for me, I make it a better day with God in my life and holding on to my faith and knowing that being kind to somebody, being considerate and forgiving 
is something that God would want me to do, it makes my life a lot easier. To all that you just said, and I'm, I'm, I was given a book back in the spring by Marissa Scott called Bait of Satan. I don't know if you've seen that book, but everything, the, how you just, what you just said is everything, at least the first couple of chapters that I've read so far, because I just started reading it this weekend, is what the book is talking about. And it's, ta- and, it's, and it's touching on those things that, you know, where we think someone did us wrong and how we hold that, and it's just poison. But it's what Satan wants us Correct. to carry with us. And I think of different people when you uh, were mentioning, you know, your brother. My, I lost my brother when I was only 10 years old. He was 16. I was a kid. I, I mean, I was in shock. I, it's like he went over his friend's house, and he still hasn't come back. You know, that's that's basically what, you know, uh, the last time I saw him, uh, last time I talked to him on the phone. So with that said, is you know, people can get bitter because that love you lost a loved one, right? Someone close to you. Why did you take why'd you take him away from me? Why why'd you take her away from me? And really this in the cycle, if you are involved in your faith, he's telling you, and then you can clarify because I think you're deeper into the book than I am. But I tell me there's a reason why he was taken early. Whether God felt he was an angel already and made him an angel right then and there, uh, that's I mean, that's how I appease my thing. But for me to carry it with it and be bitter with the people who may have been involved in driving the car and, you know, all that type of stuff, where is that going to get me? It's not going to get to anywhere. And here, when I lost my brother, he had served as a corpsman with a group of Marines. And after I lost him, that group of Marines, well, first of all, when I lost him, we had umpteen million baseball players and softball players reaching out to all of us to tell us, how he had affected their life, how they changed. Because he was a, a coach he or was just a playing? Coach. Okay. He was a coach. Mm-hmm. He was a single guy, but he coached kids for years. Mm-hmm. And, and in Clay County, everybody knew him. And the church was full of nothing but kids from younger ages on up, adults. Right. And, uh, and then the Marines were reaching out to us. And I gained a family of Marines when I lost him a group of amazing Marines that loved him dearly and shared just with guys us, he served with guys. He, and they shared with us things he had done for them. All of us learned a great lesson after his loss. We knew it about him, but we learned for sure after we lost him. Mm-hmm. And that is he didn't have a whole lot. You know, he owned a very small house, lived off very little, but what he had was the gift of time for everybody. He reached out to all those Marines all the time. He reached out to those athletes that he had coached through the years. He reached out to coworkers. He was there for everybody. He never missed a beat because he gave the gift of time. He saw what was important in real life. Mm -hmm. He wasn't looking for that financial gain at the end. He was looking for what he felt like God wanted him to do, and because he naturally was that person, he loved everybody. Well, I and I, I think you know what, and obviously what you're alluding to, he had his vision was how can I make their lives better. That's what he was. Whether right. whether it was on the softball field and making him a better softball player, baseball player, um, playing a better game, just being better, being better people all around, was his his touch, and and so. Yeah, I mean, so to go back, you know, to circle back on on, on the faith part, I see you know too many people in, in the book. They use this analogy. I was explaining this to some to my trainer this morning as we were working out. The book talk, the the um, I even forgot the name of the book. Um, All right. let's say yeah, it was basically talking <laughs> about how you want pure gold. You want God's pure gold, right? And because gold itself is impure. It's got a lot of impurities in it. So when you actually have real gold, it's malleable, it's uh, it's it's soft. It 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 allow you know it takes hits basically. You know uh, that's why I visualize from a military. You're taking hits, but you keep moving forward, right? As Rocky talks about. And you have to take gold and you have to heat it up to burn off the impurities. A lot of us are not boiling off those impurities. We're holding on to those impurities, and the impurities are 
those pe- that the people that we feel have wronged us. Right. Um, we've been misjudged. We were right. They were wrong. And you hold on to that. Our politics is the poison right now. Oh, I completely agree with that. And I think it's funny. I teach a not teach. I don't want to say teach. I lead a women's group on Thursday nights. And one of the things we talk about is, yes, this world's crazy right now. Everybody seems to be angry with everybody. Mm-hmm. But if we buy into that, how can we change anything? But if we are out there every single day sharing grace and sharing love and sharing kindness, can't we change somebody in some form or fashion? I believe we can. I think if every single day you're walking out there, you're in the grocery store, This is a funnier story. My daughter makes fun of me all the time about the way I drive when when somebody upsets me. You know, dad has one way of the way he yells or says something when somebody cuts him off. But when they cut me off, the first thing I always say, buddy, you should not have done that. And it's become a joke in the family. But it's controlling your temper and anger because if everybody held on to anger, hatred, or whatever you think has wronged you, what has that accomplished for you? How has that made your job better? How has that made your life better, your family life better? And another way would be if we were talking about coaching, one of the things I've always told all the kids, I coached my son in baseball when he was young. And then my daughter played volleyball, and I didn't coach her because I didn't know the game. But the whole team would come to my house all the time before games and practice. And one of the things I always said to kids, when you're out there on the court or the field, do you think when you scream and yell at your teammate, does that make them play better? Do they do a whole lot better because you just screamed and yelled at them? No, they don't. But if you turned around, slapped them on the back, and said, it's okay, it's okay, we got this, we're going to get them on the next one, they're going to do their best to not let you down because you're not yelling and screaming at them. And and that's what I'm talking about. Don't hold on to We've got to stop the cycle that we're creating in our country, in our world. Mm -hmm. Stop. Yeah, I obviously totally agree with that mindset. That's why I started reading this book. And I'm like, why didn't I start reading this six months ago when she gave it to me? And uh, But it's funny, I just started it this weekend. Well, we, Marissa, she's a wise woman. She yeah. sings at my church. So. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know where, wherever she got the book, but she brought it to me for the podcast and you know because i i always i had uh at that point i was always had ryan serhant's book or whatever but now i've got these two other books here billy wagner who's local and obviously my boss uh, john adams's book here on renovation loans putting those out but i I always had the book and i was i was giving out the serhant books to everyone that was coming so she knew that and brought me that book and it's it sat on my desk for that long and finally when i went on the went out on a cruise for thanksgiving and i took Billy's book, because I hadn't read it yet. I, one other book, investment book that John Brooks from Momentum Realty had given me. And then that was the third one. So I read the other two already. So I'm like, well, I got to start you know, getting into this one. And it's just ironic. And then you, you obviously you coming on the show and what, saying what you said is exactly what I'm reading in this book. Yeah. You know, uh, so it what was I'm amazing. hearing is I need to write a book. Oh, uh, yeah. So you, you, well, <laughs> I think, you know, I think a lot of people need to write a book. There's, there's, there's stories out there. And that's one of the inspirations of the podcast is everyone has a story yeah. and, and it's unique and it's in its own way. It might be a short read, uh, might be an easy read, might be a little more, more difficult depending on the things that the, uh, detailed and the things that you've done. But I, I think everyone has a story. So whether, yeah, it's, it's going on a, a few podcasts to get your word out or writing a book for sure. I mean, you're, I think, I think your experience in, you know, just learning from you here in this, you know, 40 minutes we've been talking so far, you know, your start, you kind of just like fumbled into real estate and realized, oh, yeah, this is not too bad. I like, I like helping that. people, which is a common theme everyone has come, uh, I will not say everyone has, but they've mentioned, a lot of people have mentioned coming on the show is, you know, you got to just have that people, I want to help people attitude. And I think obviously you've always had that from the start and that's why you're successful today. Well, we have a, I was raised by parents that 
instilled that in all of us. You know, my brothers are are out there just doing so much in the community and involved with everybody and helping. And my oldest brother was a high school baseball coach for years and loved in Clay County. In fact, I keep telling him he needs to run for office because he's so popular. (laughs) But our parents instilled that in it. Our, you know, my mom took in kids all the time before she passed away. And then my dad had such a humble upbringing with nothing. He, you know, he lived in a very, very small shack with, he lost his father early on. The only book they had was a Bible mm-hmm. and quit school in seventh grade, but joined the military, went on to retire as a commander. And then worked for several defense contractors, writing their contracts. So when people think because they came from such poor life, they can never succeed. I watched my father come from nothing and go on to do great things. Still that. He was one of those. He he obviously, without an education, enlisted in the Navy. He did. Then eventually become an officer. And uh, there, there are not many left that have done that through time. Now the services will, you reach a point and they feel you're good enough. They'll, they'll put you through college right. to, because they wanted to make you an, an officer candidate where I had a, a great uncle, same way, you know, from World War II through Korea to become a retired. Well, when they retired him, I guess they promoted him as he retired to a major, but he was just simply a private and, and so forth and, and went through. And I, I still, I have a card I know in one of those boxes that I saved where he wrote me a note and obviously his handwriting, but I don't think he, I don't know. I don't think he was much beyond a middle school education either. No, and I I think that the biggest thing my dad taught us is it doesn't matter what you came from. You can be anything you want if you want it bad enough. And don't let anybody tell you you can't fulfill your dreams. You can do it. It's funny, the things that affect me that really sink in my heart is hearing about that young kid killed off of Moncrief on the north side, the 13-year-old little football player. And that stays in my heart and mind because I keep thinking, what can we as a community do to help these kids over there? Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many shootings over there. What can we do to start helping these kids? Right. And yeah. it's things like that that I would like to see us all getting involved in. Mm-hmm. You know, let's start meeting with people to figure things out. There's more than just, you know, what's going on at the moment to actually walk away for that moment right. and reflect on what before you we, act. You know. We need to give kids hope. Mm-hmm. Hey, folks, this episode was produced by Streamline Media, the number one media company for helping brands generate content that converts. I knew I wanted to start a podcast to reach more people and bring value to the world, but I did not have the time or the knowledge. Streamline Media became my secret weapon to building my show. They handle all my back-end work, production, and strategies to keep my show going strong. If you're in the real estate business and looking to make content that generates more leads and brings in more revenue, check out the Streamline Media link in the show notes and discover how partnering up can supercharge your path to real estate excellence. All right, back to real estate. You're with Hover Girl. Tell, talk to you. You've been there 12 years now. Started off at property management, and then you started just slowly doing some sales. I imagine some of the newer agents, with your experience, you're working with them. I am. I uh, are within our company. You within Hover? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing with the new agents that you're working with, and then hopefully your experience? guides them in a better direction? I think, first, they're younger. So I think that's probably coming into the business. And most of them are military, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not from the area, so they have to get to know the area. They know I'm available 24-7 to answer the phone or text or email. And I'm going to pick up the phone and talk to them. But they need to learn how to network with their communities. You know, within the military, you have different communities. Knowing how to network that and just, it's the day-to-day things. You know, with rentals, 
there's a lot of things that come up with rentals, and it's how to work through some of the stresses of rentals without letting it consume your life. So at Hover Girl, do you guys promote being kind of dual purpose? I know some people are like, oh, rentals, I don't even want to deal with it, where I know my wife does very well because we are involved in a, in a condo complex where we own some units that do short-term rentals and people call all the time for rentals. And if our units are filled up, she's the other homeowners, the other landlords have gotten to know her and, you know, they give her the commission for setting, you know, sending that renter to them. And then those renters build a relationship that, of course, a lot of them are actually renting because they're looking to where to buy. Right. You know, and that sort of thing. Is that something kind of an attitude or culture thing that, that hover girl that everyone is, you know, has an attitude, a positive attitude towards doing rentals. Don't just throw them to the side. Oh, no. I think everybody in our company has a positive attitude on doing a rental. Uh, You know, because first and foremost, it's about serving the military community. Mm -hmm. So if they need a rental, we're going to help them. If they need us to manage their rental, we're going to help them. And But then if they need the sales side of it, we make it known that we do all three, you know, that we can help you find one, we can manage one for you. But if you need us to find a house or sell your house, we can do all of this. And you're right. A lot of agents out there say, no, I am not going to do rentals, which is kind of crazy to me because those tenants can become buyers or down the road, that owner of that rental may want to sell their house, any of that. Well, especially in the current you know market now, it's it's just, you might as well buy because of the rental price has gone up. The demand for rentals are so high. So if you had been building this database for 12 years, like right. you have, these people are now calling. I'm seeing a lot of applications right now uh, for those, for people who are renting and being first time home buyers because they're being basically pushed out. The rent's going up. So they're like, Hey, we might as well look to buy now. They're actually being. Well, rental prices have gone up significantly. And actually that brings me to another thing that I've been trying to address and trying to get our military to talk about this more too. You know, I can campaign all I want to try and get this change, but we need our military service members to do this. And that is BAH, which BAH is your housing allowance. Mm -hmm. It needs to be increased. We are so low compared to what the rental prices are now, it's not affordable for our military anymore. Do we still start with our local congressman sending a little note? I've gone to everybody. Mm. So there are, like at Rutherford, I went to Aaron Bean, and and they're all very eager to help. The CEOs of the bases are trying to help and do this. Right. Uh, But we, we all need to be more vocal about it because it's making Jacksonville a tough area to live in for the military if they can only rent. So in a lot of cases, we do encourage buying because you're not going to pay as much in a mortgage payment as you are on the rental side. Um, Since we're on that subject, um, Hometown Heroes, since that program went out, went basically, I guess, in the spring, roughly? Uh, Spring, summer? summer. Yes. Have you seen, has that helped? No. I, I mean, I really haven't seen, and here's, I think real estate agents need to quit communicating the wrong message, which is now's not a good time to buy. Now is a great time to buy. Uh, you know, we, ha- I, I was in a class the other day and there are a bunch of new agents saying, how do we get a buyer to buy now? And what I said was, if they were buying six months ago, quite likely they were going to be paying 50000 over what the asking price yeah. was. And that's if you get that offer. So then you're going to have to, if you did not plan on spending that much and you're getting a loan, you're going to have to cover that gap with cash. That's cash that you could have invested somewhere Mm -hmm. if you're covering a gap. If they have the cash. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, most sellers were not doing repairs. Roofs weren't being replaced. So the buyer was having to do all of that. When you look at the difference in what your mortgage payment would be now with the rates and what your mortgage payment could have been back then, they could be very close to the same, but you're not competing with umpteen million buyers and and you're getting your repairs done or possibly getting the seller to pay your closing cost. Right. And so I think it's a great time to buy. 
You know, you bring up an interesting point there, something I've been dwelling upon because obviously I'm out on social media a lot with the podcast and, pr- and promoting you guys as, as real estate agents, the, the great ones that are out there and all the things you're saying. And I said, you know, I'm seeing a huge gap. There's a few mortgage people putting out some information, the, you know, as best as way they can present it. But what I'm not seeing is, and I've been doing this 17 years, I'm not seeing a lot of agents calling us directly and saying, hey, how would I position this? I need your math because if they're going to, unless they're paying cash, then you don't need to talk to me. But if they're financing, how is a way I need to structure this? We're talking about uh, the the 2-1 buy down. And now uh, we're coming out with it here at Loan Depot. Some of the other lenders are coming out. A 3-2-1 buy down. I haven't seen the pricing on it. My guess is the reason why there isn't a 3-2-1 uh, buy down is the lenders don't like the fact that ooh, yeah even in three years that 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 payment's going to increase that much right. even though they're getting that interest difference up front they don't see that as a, a great loan to have I'm I'm really I'm interested to see how the pricing because ours hasn't actually launched just yet but it will hopefully here by the end of the month however they figure it out they got to get investors to invest in it right. right type of thing but to actually call and strategize with the loan officer on how am I going to list this house? Now, there's some in my, my, my wife did one in my neighborhood. My neighbor, you know, St. John's Golf Country, it's high demand. She priced it right, had multiple offers, sold it $20,000 over the, the original asking price. And I think she had four different offers on it with escalation clauses. High demand area, but she priced it right. There's yeah. other areas there. They're not pricing it right, and they're they're out there and they're going. Well, we can uh, we get, let's encourage them with the two one buy down. You should have already had that conversation with your seller. You should have already been educated yes. with your lender and all been in the circle before you actually put the house on the market. No, don't you're... don't wait for the buyer to come in. But you have to have that. You have to have that the gun loaded basically and ready to to launch that. You're absolutely right. Uh, you have to know. You do need to talk to the seller ahead of time because the seller side of the market is different. So you do need to be talking to them about the different things that could come up. But you also really should be communicating to your buyers that it is a good time to buy. Yeah, I think if everybody's pushing them now till the end of next year or after March, I keep hearing that over and over, after March, after March. Yeah. Well, <laughs> guess what? If everybody's waiting until after March, then we're going to have a whole flock of people again trying to get the same house. Plus, it's a much more active market than anyway, so you're going to have an influx of people. So I say if you see a house now that you like, now's the time to buy it. Yeah, I I agree. I'm going to put myself on the camera here because I'm going to probably reel this one. The rates right now are extremely familiar to the rates in October of 2008. In 2008, the 30 year fix was six and a quarter. We're very close to that right now. If you could get 5.875 at that time, you, you snatched it up quickly. So they're right where they were before the rates dropped and the government started getting involved with their quantitative easing and which pushed the rates down below they were. So you're right where the market was really between 2005 and September 2005 when I started in the business to October of 2008. So basically three years, this is the range that we're in. You know, right. it, you, 5.875 was like, oh my God. And then I, I, I did loans as high as, you know, seven, seven and an eighth on a 30 year fix all during those three year period. We're back in that situation again. And I, how many times have we said, oh, you know, I, I saw that property four years ago. I wish I paid 150000 for it. Now it's worth three hundred. You got to get in the game. Get in the game. If you can afford the home. I mean, obviously, we don't want someone to buy a home they can't Correct. afford. We're not promoting that. But if you can afford the home, it's time to buy. And again, yes, the rates drop. You can refinance. There's no doubt about it. Put yourself in a in a better, save some money, whatever it is. But the value of that home is not going down. And with the inflationary pushes right now, the value of homes are going to be pushed up with with exactly. the inflation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. So that was my little <laughs> soapbox there. Let's dig in as we're gonna, I want to round down here as we're, we're pushing a little over an hour. How important have you seen in your 12 year career is education? From, you know, whether it's a sales education that you, you mentioned you were learning early in your retail career before getting into real estate, but just going and staying abreast, uh, 
knowing the contract, going to the to the uh, classes, and obviously you guys are big on VA loans. And the, if there's one loan, I love the VA loan; it's the best loan. But if there's one one loan that has a lot of little like fine print and sidebars and little things, that you, little tricks that you could know to get someone approved, it's the VA loan. It is. Education's very important. It, uh, just recently, I sent out a thing to all our agents saying, you may know VA loans, but every time you see a class taught on it that you can make it to, go. Because we never know what's going to change yep. on something. That's the same with the contracts. We need to know everything that happens when a contract's a change and I think the only way you can do that is by going and attending the class. I mean, I went to last week. I went to a class on called the Home Loan Toolkit. It was great. The things I learned, I already knew a lot of it, but there were little tips that I wasn't thinking about. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'd like to see more lenders teaching classes. Uh, you know, I think if we can get a lot of our new real estate agents, you know what? even agents that have been in the business. If we can get into more classes with lenders it, during these slow times that we yeah. all come across, get in there with the lenders. No, Learn everything. Like you just talked about, the 2-1, the 321, ARM loans now. You know, people, when they hear adjustable rates, yeah. they go back to what it was back in... 2006. Yes. And they think it... They don't realize those were predatory loans. And that the adjustable rates are very different that we're talking about today. Yep, yeah, very much more pr protective. I will, I will say something just to put it out there on the public record. The one thing that really bothers me, and I've had lenders on the show, I've, I've often thought to have more on on the podcast to hear their stories because there are some people have been there. But there's there's this thing in our industry, and uh, I did a training on October 21st back at, over at Landmark. It was marking my 100th episode. I invited a, a couple um, agents, actually, and, well, Aaron uh, Salem is the marketing director at Roundtable Realty to come and be part of it because I knew they would draw a crowd in as well. I went as real estate excellence. Mm -hmm. If I went in there as Loan Depot, you'd, lines are drawn in the sand. I do not understand that. Why, you know, you may have a lender. I understand if you have a lender you're working with, all the time you have a relationship, it doesn't mean you can't go to another lender's class and pick a nugget out. Now, if you think the nugget's really worth it, I would highly suggest maybe throwing them a referral because I'm going to tell you what, your lender does not do everything. And when you find that loan he can't do, maybe they can't do down payment assistance or something, or they don't do the hometown heroes or whatever, whatever it might be some, or a VA renovation, you know, that's, yes. you know, something that just specifically talking about you. There are other lenders that do. So you need to have that lender in your pocket. I don't expect to get all your business. I don't draw the line in the sand because you may pick up that one nugget of education. And that's more important than all that I just talked about. I will tell you one thing that the teacher of the class I was just talking about uh, brought up is something I do. And I, I tell a lot of the new agents the same thing. When you're first communicating with the buyer, I don't give just one lender. I think we're making a mistake if we only give one lender. And here's why. It's the same with everything in our business. Don't just recommend one because if something goes wrong with that one person that you referred, right. then it comes back on me. I want my buyers to make a choice. So they taught in the class, refer three lenders. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Well, I would, I would say my, my count from my side of, of that, although I would love, you know, I'd love a real estate agent to just recommend me. <laughs> that would be great. But you need to build relationships with those. I know some top no, agents oh, I, that actually have three lenders and knows the personalities of the three lenders and they match up the personality of their buyer with, and, and try to direct them, you know, encourage that particular person to be their go-to, but they have these two of that they're, they're consistently working with and they know are good versus just giving three names of three lenders, build those relationships, go have coffee, sit down, it's ideology. What are they good at? What are they, you know, not good at? I always preach to, um, 
especially my the new agents that I meet. I, I worked in a call center for 12 years. If you you could be standing in a house right now, example the other day, he called he called me and said, hey, I gave my your name to uh, some buyers. They called on my one of my listings and I ran over there and met them and we showed the house and I gave him your name. I said, next time, put them on the phone, right? call me why they're standing in front of you and say, hey, I got Mr. and Mrs. Smith here and here they're looking at and put me out because you're going to find out right away when they start talking about finances of how how actually interested they are. Versus you going yeah. home going, oh, are they going to make an offer? Are they going to make an offer? Are they going to yes. call me back? Just because I'm that type of person, I am experienced. Not everyone's like me. They're not, you know, can go cold on the phone with someone and, and actually handle the conversation and obviously take that step towards closing. But just a little brag about myself. But <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right, though. It does need to be lenders that you trust. You do have to have relationships. So I think you're absolutely right. Right. On that. And, and it might be, it, it could be something you started recently or something you've been doing for 12 years. But what do you do consistently in your business do you think that moves the needle? I would say talking, just having real conversations with my potential customers or customers I've had in the past, you know, mm-hmm. talking. Right. I, I think it's kind of what I said to you before, the social media is not going to sell me. Only I can do that. It's picking up the phone when your phone rings and talking to that customer. It's picking up the phone and calling them. It's meeting them in person. I think that's been, it's the only way that I think I've sold myself to people right. is I've got to sell myself, not necessarily the product. You're in them. could be in a line at the grocery store. You could be in an elevator. There's other people. Or you're standing in line to go into a restaurant or something, waiting for your table or something. What is one way, you're a talker, so this kind of comes naturally, you pick up, but do you have a couple of icebreakers that kind of can get a conversation going for that person who might be a little shy? Because after you do it, you find it's easy, but what is a step that someone who, to try to be more like you and have just open conversations with really anyone and and hand out your business card, what's a way to kind of break the ice? Well, for me, and I, if I were going to explain If I'm standing in a place, you can call me either nosy or curious. I like the word curious better. It sounds nicer. (laughs) But when there's people around me, I just naturally listen in on their conversations or I I pay attention to them. And I think about this, too, going years, years back when I first worked at uh, Navy Federal Credit Union. We were trained to know when someone walked in the door what their height was, what for what security color? Purposes. Yes. <laughs> so because of that, I pay attention to people. I look at, if they have kids, you know, I'm going to comment about the, their children or I'm going to cut up and tease with their kids. Uh, if I overhear something in their conversation that I think they wouldn't mind me making a comment, then I'll just comment mm-hmm. always in a positive way. Uh, just Little things, you know, I like your outfit. That's great. Where'd you get that? Or, you know, as I said, kids are a big icebreaker. And usually it's when a kid's acting up that I'll say something. (laughs) But not in a negative way. I'll start playing with the child and get the child laughing. But also, I mean, here's the thing, too. Like, senior citizens, you know what? They like for you to talk to them. Talk to them. They may not be your customer, but, but guess their what? Kids might be. They have kids. Yeah. It's just talking and not standing there with the mind frame of I came in to do one thing and one thing only, or you know, standing at a ball game. I don't stand way down here. I don't want to talk to the other parents. That's not going to get you anywhere in this business. And honestly, if you're that person, you may not be in the right business anyway right. you gotta like right. people right. just make a subtle comment like I, there's often times where i i've actually might be talking to my wife or something but i, I actually raise my voice a little bit so others can hear so yes. they, hopefully they yes. someone like you jumps yes. in yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
It is true. Italian restaurants. <laughs> How important, again, in your career have you found, you know, like you said, you do you do some things a little differently. The, the modern age, you know, digging deep into social media, you say you subtly do it. But when it comes to surrounding yourself by successful people, you are a top producer now. You're recognized by Jack's Real Producer magazine and so forth. How important is it for you to mix and mingle with other top producers to believe you're a sponge? You want to steal positively, you know, uh, steal tips and tricks from some other people that are, might be even doing better than you. Oh, I definitely think so. I mean, obviously, Joy and Laura have done very well in the business. There are a lot of people in this area. I grew up with Cindy Gavin. So once in a while, I'll call Cindy Gavin and ask her, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've called Mario Gonzalez and run things by him. Kim Knapp. Mm-hmm. You know, I I love. She'll be on the show on the twelfth. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. I love talking to Kim. There's, and, and then I have a friend that's down in Orlando. She's been in the business less time than I have, and has done amazingly well without buying leads ever. And she doesn't pay a marketing team. She does it all herself. Has a huge team. Very successful. She would have a huge conversation about relationship building and staying she top would. of mind. She probably sends saying, Christmas cards out and oh, all that yeah. jazz. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, she's a big believer in open houses. Mm-hmm. You know, but the way she does their open houses is very different than what we normally do up here. But that's what I'm saying. I, I don't think you should just limit yourself to our town. See how somebody is succeeding in another town. You know, mm-hmm. pick up tips from them. Well, how important, you know, you talk about surrounding education and surrounding yourself by people like we're going to have a rebar event here on the 27th, but to go to an event like over in Orlando, they, they consist, there's always, you know, cause it's Orlando, there's events I wanted to go over and meet some of these people from other areas. I, I do think it's important. I mean, one, you're networking from all over the place, which is important. Uh, but two, like I said, they may be doing something that we don't do up here that you will hear and think, oh, I should do that up mm-hmm. here. So I think it is important. 100%. Um, what do you love most about real estate? Oh, it's the same canned answer everybody gives. The people. <laughs> I mean, I have made lifelong friends with a lot of the customers I've met. I've seen kids go from babies to middle school now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's definitely the people. I I had an older gen, it was an older couple, and at first, when I first met them, they rented a house. Then that house had some issues, so we got them into another house, and they realized they needed a pool because they were older. Both of them had physical issues, mm-hmm. and so then we fast forward to COVID, and the husband passed away. Oh. And, but this man was a retired old gruffy Marine (laughs) that would call me. I've got one of those at home too. Well, he would call me (laughs) at 11 o'clock at night just to talk. And it became funny. My husband would say, is that your boyfriend Stan? And I would say, yes. So when he passed away and I went over to help his wife and we were having a story, there was a time when somebody was dropping tulips off at my house. I had no idea who it was. Well, his wife said it was from Stan. He knew they were your favorite flowers, so he had been dropping them off for you. And I was so touched that he was doing that without ever saying a word to me. And his son said, yeah, he thought you were one of his best friends. And I said, he was one of my best friends. He was an amazing man that... That's what I'm saying. When you take the time to really know your customers, you get a wealth of knowledge and a beautiful relationship. Right. Right. In 12 years, is there anything, anything I, I, I write here biggest mistake, but just something you did related to the industry to educate new real estate agents or, you know, agents that might be out there listening, something you did that you would say, that's not a good idea. As far as marketing, marketing, just, yeah, maybe how you showed a house, you know, uh, listed a house. Maybe you did it wrong. You did a did something, tried something new, and just didn't work, or or like you, yeah. Uh, prob- 
I would say buying leads was a big mistake. I mean, I lasted maybe two months and I got rid of it. I said, this is It wasn't your cup of tea. Wasn't worth it. It they weren't qualified leads, and it it just wasn't a good fit. Right. Um, biggest thing I would tell all agents is even if you have a transaction coordinator, pay attention to your contract. Look at every detail. Don't rush through it. If you got a buyer that's getting new construction, read that contract thoroughly. Don't. Don't just rush through things and think that everything's going to be perfect. Pay attention to it. And to touch on the contract, and this is a recommendation I, I get, I've heard several times and want your touch on it. How important is it to go to that training every time someone's doing a contract by a different instructor? Because you're going to learn something a little different. You know what? I think that's a good point. I mean, I... I get well. I think I just accidentally have gone to different ones mm-hmm. just because of timing. But I think that's a good idea. You should go to different people teaching, right? Because I think you're just like teaching. I mean, if someone's teaching history, there might be a pe- part of history where they have they're really strong. Oh in, yeah, you know, and so they're really gonna like because they just really drilled down on that, and they want to. They just want to tell you everything they knew. And I think it's the it's the same thing in in the contract. There's different things on that contract whether it's by experience or failures that they're going to drill down on you on where another person's going to drill down on another section and just be any course, keep yourself refreshed. It's um, a lot like, you know what the analogy would be for me. It's a lot like your trivia team. Not everybody is good at one thing. You know, I obviously am not there for the history or the sports or, <laughs> but I do have a little niche that I can answer on. Right. So you are going to get something different from everybody. Right. All right. What is um, your favorite thing to do in Northeast Florida and our Florida lifestyle question? Oh, my favorite thing to do is be out on the boat, on the water, yeah. St. John's river. Oh yeah. My husband and I both grew up water people. We grew up water skiing. Uh, so I, I like the river, the lakes, the ocean, anything to do with water. And I think that it's one of the gems in Northeast Florida that a lot of people, you know, of course are finding out is we do have the St. John's river. Mm -hmm. We do have the intercoastal and get out in the ocean in St. Augustine or go out through Mayport and go out to the ocean, but you have the river, you have the intercoastal waterway and the ocean. So if you are a boater, there's just so many things to do. Oh, And there's so many great restaurants on the water. It's just, it's a casual, fun lifestyle. And uh, we always love, obviously, going out and seeing the different wildlife, whether it's a manatee oh, yeah. or the porpoises or whatever, jumping in. You know. Well, and, you know, a lot of people don't realize, both on the intercoastal and the river, there's so many sandbars that you can park your boat on, yep. and you can get out with a group of boats. That's what we do. We meet a group of boaters, and we park our boats and sit out there. Spend and, the afternoon. Yeah, where's, your favorite, it, where's your favorite spot? You guys... Well, if I tell her, is it the pineapple? No, I don't go to pineapple. (laughs) We go right off of Alpine. Alpine. You have to show me that after the show. Yeah, because I, I I'm, I'm I'm in the Freedom Boat Club, so I we bounce around to the three different marinas, mm-hmm. and so if we go to St. out of Julian Creek right here, we're going tubing, um, and oh, that yeah. sort of thing. So generally, then the kids want to actually get in and swim. So we want to go somewhere where we want to, yeah, um, do that. Um, last question: Is it more important who you know or what you know and why? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't want I don't think it's who you know. I don't think that. I think it's what you know. Why? The more you know, the more educated you are, the better agent you are for your customers. Just because you know important people, that's not going to that's not going to get a customer to want to go with you. But if you can prove to your customer that you have a wealth of knowledge, they're going to use you. They don't care who you know. Well, I think you actually just tipped on something that it's, it's actually to, because most of this conversation has been about relationships it is. and whoing you know. Um, and knowing that you do real estate, you, you said 
well, you didn't really say, but you didn't really describe like, yeah, I'd love to meet somebody and tell them, you know, how the homestead exemption works and all this other, you didn't, you didn't spill all that out. However, um, I think you are tipping on the point of the fact that you can control your education. Right. You you know you can ask, not can't necessarily control the person who may talk to you in the line at the grocery store. They may not want to talk to you. Whoever you, they just I don't want to talk. You know, there's times where I'm like, no man, I just don't want to talk to you. But you can control your education and the mm-hmm. level and how fast and, and and so forth that you can gather. And especially now where it is, it's not like it was last year where you're real running from one phone call from the next, getting the next thing, trying to get contracts in and that sort of thing, and trying to negotiate an offer, you know, or get your offer accepted. There was a lot of that action going on. Now is, you're stepping back a little bit where you need to be. I mean, and, and I, this is a t- question I typically ask, but I didn't ask it today is how important is it for an agent at any level to be scheduling some sort of education, whether it's weekly or monthly, but it has getting it on your schedule, whether it's a class put on by a lender or the title company or going down to NEFAR. I will tell you that, you know, I had not been the greatest at doing that, but from November to now, I think I 10, 11 classes that I've taken Mm -hmm. And I've got one on Wednesday, one on Friday. And in each class, I've gained a little bit more knowledge about something. So I do think every agent should be taking every opportunity they have to take a class. And then in those classes, I imagine you're conversing with some of the other agents that maybe you don't even know. You are. You're for your networking with other agents that you can rely on if you need to, or you can help. Uh, but the other thing is it's such a, a wide, uh, vast array of classes that we're taking. I'm taking right now, mm-hmm. everything from how to grow your Google business or the loan toolkit or master of CMAs, you know, things like that. It, there's so many different classes and then go to flex MLS, mm-hmm. take their classes, right. right? try to stay up on everything. Ultimately it's, it's going to give, especially a new agent who doesn't have a lot of at bats, hasn't done a lot of contracts. Would you agree? It's part of your confidence builder. It is. It is. You feel a lot better when you're meeting with somebody that you know what you're saying and doing. Right. You don't want, you don't want to go into a meeting with a customer and I promise you, they're going to ask you questions, especially if you're new, that you don't know. You don't want to be that person that says, let me make a phone call or let me check with my office and I'll get back to you. If you have that knowledge, you can do it in advance. Right. Well, I mean, would you agree? Uh, and you just think of that to not drag out our podcast here, but you know, if you're, if you're, you got a seller or buyer that wants to look in a neighborhood that you're not familiar with and maybe good to them, maybe call a, a, an agent who is popular in that neighborhood but, or the listing agent and say, Hey, what do I need? Is there anything I need to know with some highlights, some benefits of being in that neighborhood that I can share with my buyer? Or they may just ask a, a question. What's a, you know, a common question that, that you're getting over there. So, you know, before you even walk in the door. Well, well, you know, a real quick example is we had an overseas client that needed a property manager for an area that we did not cover. We didn't have any vendors covering it or anything. But because of networking, I found somebody that could do it for this customer. That customer was so pleased with us that we went above and beyond. And that's that's what networking yep. in the business can do for you. 100%, 100%. Bobby, I appreciate you coming on today. Is nice. there anything you want to say to anyone? Do we, do we cover? I think you covered everything. I covered everything and done some. Just tell everybody, go out there, spread some kindness and love. 10-4 on that. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Tracy. Yes. Appreciate it.